Peter Moss, I want to start with some basic definitions that you find on the cover of your book, and we'll start with the, the word underboss. What is it? That's the uh, number two man in a uh, Cosa Nostra family. Uh, it's very structured. There's a boss, the underboss. There's also a consigliere. They make up the administration of a particular crime family. Uh, there were 24 crime families across the United States that uh, belong to Cosa Nostra, which means this thing of ours. It's, uh, it's, it's essentially the American Mafia. Are there still 24 families active? Uh, they're there. A couple of them are, um, more than a couple of them are on the ropes right now, but yes, they are active. At least they have bosses and underbosses and consigliaries. Their power has diminished quite a bit in some areas. What's the difference between an underboss and the boss? Well, the boss is the boss in uh, Cosa Nostra, and the underboss is uh, their, uh, he's like a vice president, I guess, with more power. It depends on the individual, what each underboss makes of uh, uh, his job. He is uh, not elected, he's picked by the boss. What does the consigliere do? He's a counselor. He theoretically uh, uh, is an advisor. Uh, in real life, very few consigliaries go against uh, what the boss wants. The boss is the boss. That's a uh, refrain you uh, hear over and over again. Can the underboss tell the consigliere what to do? No, not really. Unless he's given some leeway. Uh, in the particular case of uh, the Gambino family, John Gotti was the uh, boss, uh, Sammy Gravano, Sammy the Bull was the underboss, and a man named Frank Lacazio was the consigliere, but um, uh, Sammy, uh, when John Gotti was uh, uh, not around, uh, Sammy was the boss. Also on the cover, you've got the picture of Sammy the Bull Gravano. That's right. Uh, what? What is this? Where did this name come from, the bull? Well, there were many, uh, uh, I heard many explanations about it, but in fact, what happened was when Sammy uh, Gravano was growing up in uh, Bensonhurst in Brooklyn, a very Italian neighborhood, um, when he was about uh, 10 years old, uh, his mother and father gave him a bicycle. The bicycle was stolen. And a couple of days later, a friend of his said he had just seen two boys with his, Sammy's bicycle, and Sammy ran down to the corner and found them, grabbed the bicycle with one hand and started fighting these other two fellows who were older than he was with his other hand. And across the street, there were several local wise guys, that is to say, mafia members lounging on a corner outside a bar, and they watched this. And finally they came over, they knew who Sammy was because he lived on that block. And I said, what's going on? And Sammy uh, said, they stole my bike and I want it back. And uh, finally one of these wise guys told these other two boys, let the bike go, it's Sammy's bike. And then he said something rather ominous. He said, and if your fathers have any problem with this, tell them to come see us. And the two boys ran off. And then the man who had broken up this turned to the other fellows uh, watching on the sidewalk and w said, uh, do you see this Sammy? He's like a little bull. And that was the and beginning. It stuck. On, also on the cover, you have Story of Life in the Mafia. It's the, kind of the subhead right here. Um, why, is, why is there a mafia? Why is it Italian? Well, there are... Uh, it's Italian-American, the Cosa Nostra here, and I, it's part of America. It's not an alien, by now, an alien culture. Uh, that We've had many organized crime groups uh, in America. What happens, well, we go back to good old American organized crime. I guess you can go back to the James Boys. They were here. But what basically happened was with each ethnic arrival in the United States, uh, they brought with them not only... Uh, enterprising people but um, criminals and they were organized uh, you had J Jewish uh, mobs you had Irish mobs the Italian uh, uh, had an advantage they're basically it came from Sicily and uh, Naples uh, there was an inbred uh, clannishness 
there was a history of several hundred years of organized crime, uh, especially in Sic Sicily, where the mafia started. And uh, they came, and they had an advantage in the United States because they came much more organized than the, these other groups. Uh, for a period of time, the Neapolitans and the Sicilians were enemies. And uh, it's when they formally united around 1930 in the United States that the uh, ball game was over as far as who was going to be dominant in organized crime in the United States. And also on the cover you, say, you have your name, uh, Peter Moss, and then below that is author of the Valachi Papers. Right. Um, where are you from? I'm from New York City. I grew up on the Upper West Side. I, uh, uh, the parish uh, is Our Lady of Lords Church, and um, I, I grew up there. It's, uh, I, I, I grew up in, actually in Hamilton Heights, which is just below Washington Heights. It was at the time I was a boy, it was basically uh, a German, Jewish, and Irish. What's your own background? Well, I'm half Irish and uh, half Dutch, uh, and uh, a little bit of German, I think. But basically Dutch and Irish. And if I were, uh, I've always wondered about this. Perhaps somebody listening can solve the problem. In, um, in uh, Donegal, which is one of the counties of, uh, where part of my family came from, there's a rather large fishing village called Moss. In Ireland. In Ireland. Uh, spelled the same as the Dutch version. And uh, it's pronounced mace. And it means in Gaelic a thigh bone. And uh, in Dutch, Moss, pronounced Moss, means a mace, <laughs> a club. So uh, there's some connection there, and I, I don't know what the answer is. It said you're author of the Valachi Papers. Why would that be included on the cover of the book? Well, the Valachi Papers was a landmark book as far as the mafia in America was concerned. It, Joseph Valachi was the first person ever uh, to reveal the existence of... Uh, Cosa Nostra gave it its real name. At that time, we're talking 25, 30 years ago, there was a great argument in America about whether, in fact, there was a mafia organized the way we've described it. And uh, Valachi solved the problem. He ended the argument for good. And it gave Robert Kennedy, who was then the Attorney General, the impetus to go after organized crime in America, particularly Cosa Nostra. When did you write that book? I wrote that book, uh, it was published in 1970. I wrote it in 67, 68. I broke, I was a reporter, and I broke the story that, that there was a Valachi talking to the government. And uh, one thing led to another, and uh, I, uh, I wrote the book. I, originally it was going to be uh, by him, as edited by me, and uh, Word leaked out of, that it was going. It was in the works. Valachi was in, incarcerated, and uh, the next thing, um, the United States government moved to stop publication of the book. What happened? What happened was the Italian American leaders. At that time, the mafia, as I said, there was a great debate about whether, in fact, there was a mafia in America. And uh, at that particular time, large segments of the Italian American community in America were still insecure. And uh, the Mafia used their uh, insecurity and history of persecution, I must say, to their benefit. And, and they said uh, they whipped these people together. And uh, senators and congressmen, uh, judges came to uh, Washington, to the White House. And Lyndon Johnson was the president. And um, the next thing I was told was this, this, the government moved to stop the book. And uh, if you can believe it, uh, one of the excuses was it would be injurious to uh, law enforcement. So I, uh, I fought it. I was pretty lonely there with the United States of America versus Peter Moss. It didn't sound too good. But I, in the end, I won. What I did in the end was uh, have the right to use all my interviews as long as the book was by me about him. And how, did, how well did it sell? It, you know, 24 publishers in New York turned that book down. Uh, they all told me the mafia didn't sell. 
I thought I was writing a definitive history of the mafia, particularly uh, about one person. Uh, up until then, we had treated these people as cardboard cutouts, and I wanted to do a three-dimensional picture of, uh, uh, of Valachi. When I wrote the fact that he was talking, uh, space was a big problem. I had to get into the, all the things you just asked me about the boss and the underboss, the families, the structure, and how it began. And I had very little uh, space to talk about Valachi as a, as a character. And to me, character is very important. So anyway, they turned it down. I thought I was writing a definitive history of the Mafia. In fact, I was creating a new industry <laughs> because there have been uh, at least 150 books since. The Godfather came out a year after the Valachi papers, and, uh, and there was a torrent of, uh, of books about the Mafia. Do you remember how, much, how many they sold, how many copies? Well, they printed the publisher who did... Uh, uh, finally published the book, only did it because one editor there insisted on it, and, uh, and they brought it out in January, and I had been told January was a terrible time to bring out a book, and my editor, Arthur Fields, is now dead, uh, had a wonderful excuse. I didn't argue. He says, no, he says, this book is going to be so good. We're bringing it out in January because... Um, People are going to get a lot of books for Christmas that they don't want, and they'll bring those gifts back in and exchange it for the Valachi papers. They printed 20,000 copies, and it was sold out in three days. I was out in California somewhere, and in those days, the technology of printing was not uh, what it is now. He finally fessed up and called me, and he said, come on back. There's not a book in the country. And it took uh, seven weeks before uh, new editions were uh, to answer your question, in the United States, it sold uh, about two and a half million copies in hard and soft. Uh, it was translated in 14 languages. And uh, it was made into one of the worst movies uh, I've ever seen. <laughs> who starred as Joe Bonson? Uh, Charles Bronson, and who was a huge international star. And um, as a matter of fact, it outgrossed, I'm told, The Godfather in Japan and Germany because of Bronson. What impact did the Valachi Papers book have on the whole process of, of investigating the Mafia? Well, I mean, it, it suddenly the, you didn't hear from publishers uh, the Mafia didn't sell. That, that was a major impetus. The movie was a bad movie. I want to say one thing, but the, uh, this book was such a huge success, you'd think it, if it had been about crocheting, they would have made a movie out of it. There wasn't a studio in California who dared make this picture. They all be were believers that, you know, their theaters would be blown up, their the studio lots would be blown up. In fact, uh, later on, I, an FBI agent let me listen to a tape of a couple of, we're talking now 25 years ago, talking about the Valachi papers, and they weren't talking about blowing up anything, they were talking about who was going to play them. And I, one priceless moment was when one of them said, maybe Paul Newman could play me, and the other guy said, no, no, he says, your eyes are brown, his are blue. <laughs> so, but it scared everybody, and finally Dino De Laurentiis, an Italian producer, bought the rights to the book, uh, and he felt being an Italian, it took the curse off everything and so on, and, but even with him, they wouldn't do it. And finally he gathered the money uh, to, to make the picture and brought it to the United States, and at that point, he still couldn't get any studio to distribute it. And finally, Columbia Pictures did. They were on the ropes at that time, and uh, they had nothing to lose. So they bought the distribution rights for the United States, and they hit a bonanza. It was, it was a big, big hit commercially. A couple things in the book. You say that the mafia or the Cosa Nostra do not kill porters and cops. And judges. Uh, as long as they're not connected, uh, there is, the, as far as I know, one reporter in uh, Chicago was killed, a judge in Philadelphia was killed. They were on the mob payroll. That makes the difference. Was it a legitimate reporter in Chicago? Yeah. Do we, you, can you but, say who it was? Yeah, I can't remember. It's Jake. I, I can't remember his last name. It was in the mid-30s. But he was on the payroll. And uh, I just can't remember his name. And uh, once that happens, they don't consider you, quote, a reporter or a judge. You're working for them. 
But generally speaking, they do not. They, uh, I think it's fair to say, unlike uh, these new gangs that are organized crime groups that are coming up, the Russians and the Chinese, they don't have that structure. They'll kill anybody. Upper West Side of New York, where'd you go to college? I uh, went to Duke University. What did you study? Uh, political science, history. And you came out of there in what year? 50. Where'd you go then? I went to Paris. I, went, I got a job at the Herald Tribune. The only, um, the only uh, course I was having a lot of trouble with was French. And it looked bad. And I went into with the head of the department. I said, look, I'm, I'm doing my best. I was ed editor of the magazine. I was working for a local newspaper. And I also wrote a column for the college newspaper. I said, look, I haven't really been doing too well with this, but I'm going to go to France, and I promise you I'll come back in three years, and I'll spend a whole hour talking to you in French, if you pass me. Did you do it? Yeah. All the way. What I did was, I, when I arrived in uh, Paris, I moved to the 13th arrondissement. It was called the Red Arrondissement. All French. No American tourists. Anybody went there. So I learned French. Of course, I learned Argo. I learned slang French. and. Um, my accent, uh, I never worked, did well with my accent, but then I found out that uh, the French find an American accent, speaking French, somewhat like we find a French accent speaking English, a, a sort of charm to it. And when I was a reporter, people would say, how do you know, how do you speak so well with this horrible accent? It was kind of an icebreaker if I was interviewing somebody. 1950, you got out of Duke. 1970, yeah. you wrote the Valachi Papers. Yeah. Those 20 years, you were a reporter right before Valachi. Where'd you work? Well, I was, uh, after the, the Tribune and a couple of other things I did, I, I was drafted. I was in the Navy in the Korean War, although I wasn't in Korea. And then when I got out, I went to work uh, first mag I went to work for magazines. I worked for Collier's, uh, Look Magazine, the Saturday Evening Post. And uh, I evolved into an investigative reporter. And uh, then after uh, just about the time I was working on the Valachi Papers, I was one of the founding writers of uh, New York Magazine. What year was that? Uh, that we're talking 68. That's when it started. What was your first book? My first book was a one, you know, I love it so much. It was called The Rescuer. And it's while I was a reporter and I... Uh, I, it was a story I was working on. I met a wonderful guy, an admiral, ex former admiral named Swede Momsen, who had developed the uh, diving bell and the Momsen lung. And uh, he, uh, in 1939, a submarine called the Squalus went down in 243 feet of water off Maine. And Swede Momsen saved everybody who was on board, who was still alive when it hit the bottom. It was a really, and he, and he also raised the submarine because it was the prototype for all our submarines. It was the eve of World War II. And it was a great book and a great guy, and it didn't do well because uh, at that time, you know, it's Woodstock and so on. Nobody was interested in the submarine that went down in 39. If I count right, you have eight nonfiction plus the one I'm holding and three fiction. Right. Serpico's in the middle of all that. Yeah. Manhunt. What was, what was, uh, which, the most recent before this one? A Killer Spy. It was how the FBI uh, pursued and captured Alder James, the CIA traitor. In a child's name, the legacy of a mother's murder. That was, uh, that's an interesting story. Uh, can you give me a couple of minutes on this one? Because one of the things uh, that's disillusioning uh, to an investigative reporter is that you think you can change the world. And uh, basically you're not. It's keep scoring all these terrible things go on. I can think of only two times in my life where I actually definitively changed something. One, I was uh, uh, working for, the, um, for Look Magazine, and I got involved in a story about a black man in death row in uh, Louisiana and Angola. He'd been there 14 years, five times came close to... to uh, being executed, and um, I basically I wrote a piece that showed him that he was innocent, and he eventually uh, just started a big campaign to get him out, and he was so I made I made a big difference in his life, 
and the in a child's name I was working on a novel called Father and Son when I got a call from a friend of my wife's who was a lawyer who was representing um, a, a family in uh, Staten Island, New York, and uh, it was a huge custody case. A dentist from all American dentist from Indiana had uh, murdered his Italian American wife brutally. I mean, so brutally you cannot believe it. And uh, there had been a custody fight after he was convicted of the murder, and there was a custody fight afterwards between the sister of the dead woman and the parents of the murderer from Indiana. It went on for about a year, and eventually the sister and her husband won custody of the uh, little boy, who's uh, maybe 18 months old by now, and or t two years. And uh, uh, they got custody, but the first two weeks, uh, the grandparents could take this boy, little baby, back to Indiana. And uh, so she's telling the story, and I'm thinking, oh, it's another custody case. And uh, what happened was that uh, two weeks later, the sister calls to say she's on her way out to marry in Indiana, which is where the town was that grandparents lived in. And they said, don't bother coming. We've just adopted little Philip. I said, I can't believe this. And, and America is illegal, what they did. Indiana would not give the baby up. It was in the court system there. And suddenly it was no longer uh, a question of the baby. It was the Midwest versus the East Coast, English German stock versus Italian American. Uh, Marion is, uh, it's. Uh, very evangelical and revivist, the Baptist, et etc. Cetera, et cetera. These people were Catholic. I mean, you had everything going there. And I said, I can't believe this is actually happening. And, uh, and I'll stop everything and I'll try to write a piece. And time is running out. If something wasn't done in the next month, uh, that little baby was going to stay in Indiana for the rest of his life. So I go out there and I find out it's all true. And I talked to people, I talked to judges, for instance, and one of them said, oh, no, that the Teresa Benigno, that was the dead woman, and her father's a mafioso. I said, what? You see that, you know, there is another side to this. I said, he's what? He said, yes. I said, he's a school teacher in New York. I, you know, you're talking to somebody who wrote the Valachi papers. How can you say something like this? I said, look. His name ends in a vowel. That's the problem here. But let me tell you something. I have never heard, I've heard uh, mafioso taking on, on jobs to disguise what they're doing, but I have never met one who was a school teacher. I can tell you that. No, no, no. Finally, I said, look, let's assume you're right. He is a member of the mob. After what Dr. Dennis, uh, T Kenneth Taylor did to his daughter, he hit her 24 times in the face with a barbell that would weigh about the same weight. And you can imagine what she looked like. Do you think that if he was a member of the mafia, that Dr. Taylor would be walking around today? And suddenly it was like a, like a light bulb went on in everybody's head. They said, well, well, maybe you're right. Bottom line is I brought the baby back from Indiana as a result of this article. And then I, at the time, I didn't know that... Uh, the history of Dr. Taylor, he tried to kill his second wife and he had done something equally horrible to his first wife and, uh, and that he almost beat this case. And I didn't know all that. And a great rural detective work uh, was involved here and it was touch and go about whether he'd be uh, convicted or not. So I said, well, that's something I didn't know about. So that evolved into a book. Where's that baby today? In Staten Island, doing very well. You talk to... Uh, no, not too much, because I'll tell you one thing, uh, Ryan, in some of these instances, uh, you get so close to the people, and you're asking them, they, you, they pour out their souls to you, and, uh, you know, it's, it's almost... There's a dependency factor. They were dependent on me to bring back the... 
<coughs> the boy. There have been other instances of <coughs> where I've gotten very close to people, and uh, it's almost like it's uncomfortable. I, I try to break off as much as possible these emotional relationships for my own sanity as well as... So, uh, I know the tr truth is, uh, Marie, I stay in touch with a little bit. She was a woman who brought down the Democratic administration in Tennessee. I talk to Serpico once in a while, but I try to keep an arm's length. How, how big is this man? He's 5'5". Five five. Did that affect him? No, never, he's not. Uh, no, I don't think so. I, a lot of mafioso, or, or, he was shorter than most, but um, no, I don't think so. Where was this picture taken? Uh, which one? The one of him with his hand up. Uh, here, he was testifying in a Senate hearing about organized crime. What year? Uh, I think it was uh, 91. Where is he today? I don't know. How did you meet him first time? Uh, what happened was this. Um, he was in the witness protection program. He had testified against Scotty and several other mafiosi leaders. And uh, he was in the witness protection program. And apparently a number of writers had written to him through the marshal service. They have to deliver his mail. Uh, saying, we want to do your book. You can be the whatever you want. We'll do. And he, uh, I think that's when he got the idea of cooperating with the book. I don't think he had really thought about it until then. And they were promising him the sun and the stars and everything else. And uh, he's, uh, Sammy is very smart. And uh, just the mere fact that these people were approaching him made him a little suspicious, I guess. He asked a trusted friend uh, for a recommendation if somebody could maybe write his story. And she uh, was a woman, uh, recommended me. Now he had read the Veloci papers, uh, but she sent him my last book, Killer Spy, and he, he really liked it a lot. So the next thing I get is a phone call from the Marshal Service saying, would I like to meet him? And I, of course I would. First of all, I, I gotta see what kind of person he's, he is. If I'm gonna, it's gotta be my book about him, that's gonna be a problem. And uh, so arrangements were made uh, for me to meet him. Uh, all I had altogether eight meetings with him, all west of the Mississippi, different places. Every time, different places. Yeah. But the first time was um, I was told to go to a certain city, and I got there. And there, there was I was met there and told to go to another city in the west. By who told you to do that? Marshall. And I arrived. I, I don't mind telling you the first city I went to uh, where the initial meeting took place because I'd never been there before. I don't think I'll be back. He'd never been there before and he hadn't gone back. And none of the marshals who were guarding him were there. It was Salt Lake City. That gives you an idea of uh, the remoteness of... Uh... So anyway, I... What uh, year is this? Uh, this is uh, two years ago. And... Uh, I, meet, I met at the airport, I'm taken to a hotel. I'm picked up in the morning and taken to another hotel where he is, but he's not living, staying there. This is where we're gonna meet. He's still staying somewhere else, I presume another hotel. Are you by yourself? I'm by myself. And uh, we spent three days together and, uh, and that was the beginning. How did you gather the material? Meaning, did you write it out or did you record it? I recorded about 80% of it. How many total hours? 50, roughly. And then uh, there were a lot of uh, other interviews that were, I didn't use the recorder. Did you ever talk to him by phone then? Yes. How many people did he kill? Actually, physically kill one. Who was that? The first one, a man named Joseph Colucci. All the, uh, the other, uh, he's confessed to complicit He's complicit in uh, 19 murders altogether. The others he set up. Uh, actually, he said to me one time in, in a hit, which is when you're killing somebody, pulling the trigger is the simplest part. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to pull a trigger. 
at setting them up that's important. People have said to me, how can you sit there talking to somebody who was involved in 19 murders? And I say, well, first of all, you have to look at it in context. In that world that he lived in, which is reprehensible, that's uh, obviously the case, murder is a commonplace, everyday event. It is a uh, way to maintain discipline and power. And uh, if people's eyes are still glazed over when I'm saying this, I said, well, Joe Valachi, he was involved in 33 hits. So Sammy's 19 is not that overwhelming. And I said, also, I had spent, uh, he, uh, one of the things that I wanted, he had a very clear vision of what he had done. Uh, I was thought, you know, there's a possibility this is sociopathic personality. Never once did he, or sociopaths try to find excuses for things. It's not their fault, they're victims, this, that, and the other thing. Devil made me do it. He had a perfectly clear vision of everything he did. He made one enormous mistake, which was joining Cosa Nostra. I mean, he now recognizes, but uh, that's it. He's certainly not a born-again Christian. How did he join the Cosa Nostra? He was recruited. It was a big thing in Bensonhurst. That part of Brooklyn he is from is almost entirely Italian-American. The shadow of Cosa Nostra looms very high. It's like a Sicilian village. You know, I grew up in New York. I, most of my friends live in New York. I, I don't think one person out of a thousand that I know who lives in New York has ever been to Bensonhurst. Have you? Yeah, well, I spent a lot of time there. Bensonhurst becomes a character in this book. Bensonhurst has, um, uh, I introduced the book, uh, I start the book by introducing Bensonhurst. It has, in terms of crime, when we think of New York, muggings, robberies, um, rapes, street crime, it is almost the best place to live in New York. Safe. Safe. It's got a high murder rate. But they're all connected <laughs> with Cosa Nostra, and uh, Cosa Nostra doesn't go around shooting people. All the hits have to be ordered by the boss. That is critical. All of Sammy's hits were ordered by his bosses. The first one, he was uh, in another crime family before he ended up in the Gambino crime family, and uh, each, every hit has to be authorized by the boss of the family. And so otherwise the chaos would result, you know, people would be shooting each other all the time. If you commit an unsanctioned murder, uh, you're, you're as good as dead yourself. You mentioned 24 families in the United States, five in New York? Mm -hmm. Unique. Unique meaning what? Uh, only in New York are there more than one family. And Chicago has one family, Philadelphia has one family, Boston had one family, and Kansas City had one family, and on and on. The five in New York are named? They are now, the, they're the uh, Gambino crime family. Is which, there a Gambino alive? No. Uh, the, uh, I'll just digress for a minute. Up until, uh, up until the mid-1960s, a crime family took its name from its boss. But once... Uh, Robert Kennedy and the Justice Department, the FBI. Remember, the FBI was under J. Edgar Hoover, was saying there was no mafia either. Don't we shouldn't forget that. Once it became clear that there was, and efforts were made to uh, to do something about it, this tradition of naming the family after the current boss ended, because it had just attracted too much attention. For instance, you have, so the Gambino family was named after Carlo Gambino, and he died. And Paul Castellano succeeded him. He was the uh, victim of probably the most famous mob hit of our times in front of Sparks Steakhouse in Manhattan. When did that happen? 1985, just before Christmas. Here's a picture of him. That's right. And you tell the whole story about I tell this. the whole Sammy was there. And uh, the other crime families are the Genovese family, uh, the uh, Bonanno family, the Lucchese family. What am I missing? Colombo, Gambino, Genovese. Colombo, Colombo. Yeah. Yeah. 
Joe Colombo was, you know, assassinated. Uh, or, well, he, he was not assassinated. He was shot and turned into a vegetable in a great rally at Columbus Circle about in the late 1970s. How many people do you think in the whole United States are involved in the Mafia? Made members, sworn, inducted members. Um, I think it, at its height, it was probably uh, 4,000. Uh, but they are surrounded by associates. You can multiply that figure enormously. What is this, an associate? Associates are brought in. They're wannabe members or people who are prevented uh, by, in Cosa Nostra, your father must be Italian to be inducted. So there are a lot of uh, potentially terrific <laughs> mafios who can't be because only the, uh, their mother was Italian. At the end of your book, you, um, and you're actually in the epilogue here, if I can find it, you have a, a figure, a, a dollar figure that I want to bring up. Okay. Um, and it's a second here. It says that among them was Tommy Gambino, the son of Carlo Gambino, and the czar of the family's empire in the garment industry, right. which cost the American public an average of $3.50 in hidden taxes for every $100 spent on clothing. That's right. When? Until uh, Sammy testified. How did it change then? Well, what happened was they broke it up. It's under control of the... Uh, a, uh, in New York, uh, it's under control of a um, court-appointed monitor, theoretically, uh, uh, and so far it seems to be working. Uh, their stranglehold over the Carmen Center, not only in New York, and the rest of the country, was trucking. I mean, you have to move this stuff. And um, they had a little hammerlock on the Teamsters. Uh, and uh, th that's been broken, pretty much. What else in the society costs us more money because of the Mafia? Construction. Where? Well, wherever there's uh, New York, for, for instance, Chicago, places like that, the, uh, the, the control of the concrete industry. It all, and building, buildings, it all, again, the choke point was the Teamsters once again. Say you're a developer and you've got a hundred million dollar project going and most of it's borrowed money and racing the clock and uh, and uh, you're, you're not playing ball with the mob and suddenly uh, the uh, outside your building site there are 70 trucks lined up trying to get in because the uh, local uh, teamster steward is n not doing anything illegal he is checking everything he's checking the lights the license, the dues of the driver, the brakes, the whatever. He goes by the book and it takes an hour for each truck to pass and meanwhile the developer's going crazy. So he becomes very cooperative. <laughs> Is that still active? Yes, no, less so. And then the developers pass it on to the consumer. That's the point. There's a very there's a calibration here. They never go so far as to kill the goose that lays the golden egg. As long as the developer uh, can pass on the cost of what he's paying the mob to the consumer, it's okay. Uh, hijacking the insure, everything that comes into uh, international airports like JFK. Hijacking is enormous, and you, the consumer is paying for those insurance premiums because they go up all the time. Much of this is at least temporarily over. Uh, because of Sammy uh, Gruano's testimony, uh, primarily because of it, uh, the mafia in America is on the ropes. It's not knocked out. And I'm, it's not to say that it won't come back. I don't know if it'll come back with the same discipline and the same structure that it had before. Because um, just in Sammy, uh, because of Sammy's testimony, uh, testimony, not only John Gotti is in jail for the rest of his life, but the bosses of two other families are in jail. And he sent 38 uh, members of the mafia to prison. And the interesting thing about it is maybe three times that number have now decided to cooperate with the government. 
Sammy Gravano was somebody very special. He was very respected. It was stunning to find out that he uh, had become a government witness. And uh, for a long time, he suffered a great deal of vilification. Sammy the Rat. I mean, he was surprised. And the media went along with this. The media loved John Gotti. I think they were a little disappointed that they didn't have John Gotti to write about anymore because John Gotti looked like what America wants a gangster to look like. With his $2,500 suits, his arrogance, carefully quaffed. He played, the cameras loved John Gotti and he loved the cameras. Where is he? He is in, uh, at the moment, in uh, Marion, Illinois, which is the toughest uh, federal penitentiary in the country. He's in for life. He lost his fifth appeal uh, for a new trial a couple of months ago. Now, when you say the media loved him, what kind of media? All of it. Television, print. I mean, my God, you had newspaper, you had, look at the, every time he shows up, there's a huge crowd. He arrived every night. He was, I mean, he, I was surprised New York City didn't put him up as one of the major tourist attractions <laughs> of the city because every afternoon around 5.30, he'd arrive in Mulberry Street in Little Italy in his gleaming car, and he'd get out and he'd wave to everybody, and there'd be cheers, John, John, John. And... Uh, uh, that's the way it was. He, uh, there's a fascination uh, with, with this life. The media, and I say all, like from the Times, the, the, all the wire services, all the television, crews would be coming from Latin America, Sweden, Germany, France, covering John Gotti. You named Judge Webster, former head of the FBI and the CIA. Mm -hmm. You named Rudy Giuliani. Mm -hmm. You named Jim Calstrom. Yes. These are people that uh, most people have heard of and seen uh, as people that played a role in all this. And RICO and Title III. Explain all that and how did, how did this, this, why did Sammy Gravano say, I'm going to talk? Well, shall I start with that? Yeah. Sammy Gravano uh, decided to talk because... First of all, the conventional wisdom is that he did it to save himself from prison. When Sammy was 27 years old, newly married, with a, a year-old daughter and a pregnant wife, was framed on a double homicide in Brooklyn. The district attorney was after a major capo, that's a captain in the family, and he offered Sammy immunity if he would testify against the capo. Now Sammy's facing life in prison, on the verge of starting his life, married life, and he said no, he wouldn't do it. So if he ever was going to flip, as they say, that was when, that was the time. The reason he, uh, he testified against Gotti was that, uh, first of all, cause an officer stop being what he thought it was. He was a true believer in the beginning. And John Gotti made the mistake of, uh, of saying to Sammy, is in they're both facing trial. John Gotti says to uh, Sammy Gravano, this is not about me. Sammy wanted to try to get a severance in his case uh, to fight it on his own. Uh, Gotti had refused to let him meet with his own lawyers without Gotti being present. He would not let Sammy listen to any of the FBI tapes. Uh, These audio tapes? Audio tapes. Where had they gotten? I mean, what, what, what did they capture? Well, Jim Calstrom was in charge of that. Uh, and who is Jim Calstrom? Jim Calstrom is now runs the New York office of the FBI. At the time, um, he was in charge of uh, special operations, which is essentially was electronic eavesdropping. We saw him a lot during the TWA yes, 800 investigation. He is just a terrific guy. And uh, they got all these tapes. And Sammy uh, was not allowed to do any of this. And then Gotti says to him, you know, it's not personal. It's not about me. It's about Cosa Nostra. 
but John Gotti is Cosa Nostra. Do you have a problem with that? And Sammy had a big problem with it. Why? Because he did not believe he saw what John Gotti was like. He did not equate him with, uh, with his vision, Sammy's vision, of what Cosa Nostra was supposed to be. What do you think he was? Hmm? What did he? What did Sammy think? I don't he think was? it was a, a brotherhood full of honor and loyalty and uh, honor and loyalty. And John Gotti had escaped con uh, conviction how many times? Three. He got the name the Teflon Don after which he loved after a, a conviction that everybody thought he was going to get, but he didn't get convicted because Sammy fixed the jury. He bought the foreman of the jury. For how much? Sixty thousand dollars. He the foreman wanted one hundred and twenty. Sammy negotiated it down to sixty. I often wonder if John Gotti knew about these negotiations. Uh, that Sammy Sammy's a very tough negotiator, and uh, for John Gotti to give him one hundred and twenty, what, what do I care? Did they ever convict the foreman of? Yes, he went to prison. And uh, so there, some other little things happened uh, during this. The 12 months that Gotti and Gravano spent in detention, waiting trial, was the closest they'd ever been. Where were they? At the uh, Metropolitan Correctional Center in New York City. Did That's, they see each other? Yes. What year was this? This is uh, uh, 90, 89 through 90. And a lot of little things happened that made Sammy take another look at John Gotti. For instance, Sammy had been in the Army. He loved the Army. As a matter of fact, they wanted him to stay. As a matter of fact, he said, I know it sounds a little chilling, but he said, you know, I wouldn't have mind going to uh, Vietnam. You got medals for killing people there. Uh, you know, it's something to think about. Anyway, the Gulf War is going on when they're in detention. And John Gotti is insisting that Sammy and two or three other people for the uh, route for the Iraqis. And Sammy said, hey, boy, are you, you've got to be choking. There's some, they could be our sons over there. Maybe we hate the government, but what are you talking about? Little things, and there were other little things that made Sammy start taking a really second look at uh, Gotti. But the bottom line, I suppose, is when the news came that he was uh, testifying against Gotti, it was Sammy the Rat, and so on and so forth. But now, my sources in the FBI tell me that in these social clubs where the mob hangs out, they turn the wires, as they call them, the devices, up after my book was published, about two weeks afterwards. And so it was a big subject for conversation, obviously. And what the FBI was here, one supervisor told me if I were a betting man, I would have lost my shirt. I said, why? He said, I wasn't hearing any more Sammy the Rat Bastard anymore. I was hearing Sammy told the truth, 100%. Why? It was John Gotti who brought this all down on us. And John Gotti tried to screw Sammy, and Sammy screwed John first. John Gotti was the boss of what family? The Gambino family. And was and the most at that time the most powerful family in America, and and Sammy the Bull Gravano was his underboss, number two man. Who was the consigliere? Frank Locasio, who was also a defendant in this case. And they all came at one time from being a captain. What's a captain? Captain is a capo. Is a um, the structure is a boss, underboss, the consigliere on the side. Then you have capos, captains also in slang called skippers because they are in charge of crews they're called crews and these crews are made up these are made members are made up of uh, soldiers which is the lowest level and the soldiers have to be members they have to take the blood oath yes how do they do the blood oath well it's uh, complicated uh, it's fairly well known but the key is um, you have to swear f the key f first key question is will you kill for the family i cannot emphasize it more that you know the sammy because of 19 people is not unusual in this world because the first question you're asked is will you kill for the family and the answer is obviously yes i mean that is part and parcel of the oath you're uh, you uh, you're 
finger is uh, pricked to draw blood, and uh, that's the blood part of the oath, where you swear fealty to Cosa forever. You're told that you walk in on your own feet, and the only way you can leave is in a box. Uh, you hold a burning saint, the photograph of a holy saint, in your hands, and you say, if I betray the secrets of Cosa Nostra, I will burn like this saint. That is fairly well known, those things. What, uh, what fascinated me was Sammy, because he, he has this wonderful memory, and he's got a sense of setting scenes. He told me what was going on through in his mind while all this was going on, which I'd never gotten before. I'd heard about the oath from Valachi many years ago, and there were wonderful little scenes. Sammy said he was so mesmerized, so excited, as he said, I was high as a kite while he was being in inducted that he forgot to move the paper back and forth in his hands. And when he the ceremony was over and he sat down, he looked and they were covered with blisters, <laughs> which he had never felt. But it's those tiny little details that certainly made this book uh, special. So anyway, you're in there and you're told, uh, and this is his one great regret, uh, you're told that your loyalty to Cousin Oscar comes before loyalty to your personal family, personal wife, your children. If the boss calls you in and your son is dying in a hospital, you've got to come in. You've got to leave your son. You swear to do all that. And that is Sammy's one great remorse. He said, you know, the fact that I put loyalty to Cousin Oscar over loyalty to my wife and my kids is something I'll have to live with for the rest of my life. This photograph of the three women. Three women. Yes, there's two sisters and his wife. Where's his wife? In the middle. Where is she now? I don't know. What happened to the marriage? They got divorced. It's a friendly divorce. She refused to go into the program. She's a, I would have loved to meet her. I think she's a very feisty lady. Uh, who said, you know, that part of your life is not my life, and I'm not going to put myself and my kids through the witness program and all that business. And Sammy said, fine, you're the mother, you have to decide what's best. Who's this young lady here? Uh, we're... Graduating. That's his daughter. Where is she? Uh, at the moment, I'm not sure. I, I think she may be in New York. I'm not positive. I've never met her. Does I never she met use the, the name Gravano? Yes. And but he, they don't, again, that's the other thing about Cosa Nostra, and I hope it's still there too, besides the cops and, the, and the, the reporters and so on, and the judges, they don't kill relatives. I mean, what did she have to do with anything? I mean, they're very sensible about that. He's had plastic surgery? Uh, but it just made his face look younger. I don't know what they had in mind. Um, all they did was, uh, that photograph was taken about four months ago. Where, do you know? No, I wasn't there. Uh, plastic surgery just made him look younger. Does he look like this now, or is this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why did he let him? Well, that's the key to Sammy. Uh, he, um, it's one of the things that attracted me immediately about him when I met him. He's so upfront, so straightforward. Now, the reason he's on that book jacket is that one day after we'd finished interviewing, I'd finished interviewing him, we were having a drink. He drinks beef eater martinis and Sonoma, two olives. Um, he was talking about a mafioso who had appeared on television in an interview, and he, the, uh, he was wearing a wig, this mafioso, and he had a f fake nose. And Sammy said, you know, he looked just like a clown. And uh, he didn't say any more than that, but it was clear to me that he, Sammy Gravano, was never going to look like a clown. And the bottom line is he believes he's done the right thing, and he isn't going to spend the rest of his life cowering in some dark corner. You're being sued? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, well, I guess I'm being sued. I'm not sure. Papers are flying back and forth. But the lawsuit is about whether or not he's sharing in the profits. That's right. And you say? I say I haven't paid him any money, 
and I know uh, Harper Collins hasn't paid him any money, and um, that's our stand, and we're fighting this on the First Amendment. They want to see my contract, and uh, I, I think it's a big intrusion. I don't think the Son of Sam law is... Um, what is the Son of Sam law? It's, it's, it, it originally was a, a criminal could not profit from his crimes. That was overturned by the Supreme Court, and they rewrote the law again. Now, I'm getting into stuff that I'm not supposed to talk about because I'm not a lawyer, but generally speaking, I think they changed it so relatives of victims, crime victims, could uh, sue. We didn't get to Judge Webster, and we're about out of time. We didn't get to Rudy Giuliani. Uh, we talked a little bit about Jim Kallstrom. Can you point to any, the RICO law make a difference in all Yeah, it was critical. Critical. And it's in the Cr book, of course. Right. RICO, the RICO statute was critical. The Justice Department didn't understand how to use it for a long time. Basically, uh, it used RICO to make a family, a crime family, a criminal conspiracy. And if you had anything to do with that family, you were facing big time in prison. Do you have another book in mind? Um, no, well, I'm noodling. What does that mean? Well, I'm thinking about it. What's the subject area? Well, I don't know. I mean, I wanted, there's a novel I want to write, but my representatives say, uh, come on, come on, write another nonfiction book. For my loved ones, my wife Suzanne and my sons, John Michael and Terrence, and in loving memory of Audrey. My first wife is the mother of John Michael. I'm uh, show you how crazy a writer can be. His, Audrey, my wife, was a very talented woman. She produced Eleanor and Franklin, the, the television series, and uh, Alice doesn't live here anymore in the movie. Uh, she died as a result suddenly of an auto accident. So I have a 30-year-old son named John Michael, and I'm now remarried, and I've got a five-year-old son named Terrence. <laughs> and I shouldn't be uh, having five-year-old. So people come up to me and occasionally and say, yeah, a wonderful grandson. On that note, <laughs> Here's the cover of the book. It's called Underboss, Sammy the Bull Gravano's Story of Life in the Mafia by Peter Moss. Thank you very much. Great being with you, Brian. Four days after this interview was taped, Sammy Gravano testified in federal court that he did receive a portion of Peter Moss's advance and stood to make money from the film rights. The allegations received considerable press coverage because his testimony contradicts statements about the book by Mr. Moss and Harper Collins.